Science Institute Student Council's Outlier Detected. Our show aims to showcase experiences and perspectives from leading data scientists in the field. I am Shreya Verma, a current data science graduate student, member of the Student Council, and today's host. Along with me, we have my co-host Sarthak. Hi, I'm Sarthak Bhargav, a fellow student here at the Data Science Institute. Today, we're delighted uh, to have with us Karnan Dominguez, a member of the first Masters in Data Science cohort here at Columbia back in 2014. Uh, hi, Karnan, would you like to say a bit more about yourself? Hi, guys, nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm Carmen Dominguez, as they said. Uh, I graduated and started in the 2014, but ended up graduating in 2018, was doing part time and some time off to work and everything. Um, but yeah, happy to talk more about it. Yeah. So my here, my yeah. you know, professional uh, trajectory, whatever you guys think is interesting, we'll talk about. Of course. So, I mean, given um, data science was pretty new in 2014, mm -hmm. um, especially at Columbia, we were the first cohort. So, what persuaded you to pursue a master's in data science? Right, so I did my undergrad in applied math on economics back at Harvard. Um, and I always was interested in how to apply, you know, science and, and math and so on to like real life applications, right? Like I enjoy doing the sort of theoretical math and the proofs and all of that, but I really got a kick out of how to use these skills. I guess math is a tool to real world problems, right? To solve real world problems. Um, so I started my career interning finance, then I went to the World Bank when I graduated. Um, I was there for a couple of years, started, you know, doing consulting, ended up working on election campaigns in Brazil, um, doing the micro-targeting, and I guess we'll talk more about that later, probably, but um, I eventually came to New York, started working for a startup here, um, doing ad campaigns on Facebook platforms, right, was the startup doing that. Then I moved to another startup, and then the second startup is where I was in this hybrid role, or sort of bridge connecting the data science and the business science. Um, but as you know, the story evolved, I got pulled more and more to the data science side, right? It wasn't really necessarily called data science back then, because it was like early 2014, right? Right. Um, and this was when people were starting to talk about data science, and started to talk about machine learning. And on my job, I was learning how to code in Python, right? I had some coding background from college and, you know, previous internship, um, and just sort of side projects that I had done throughout high school and so on. Um, but I didn't know Python, so I started learning, teaching myself Python, and then I started implementing algorithms um, in this in the startup, right, more data science and algorithms, and then we're starting to talk about machine learning and what is that, so I was learning a lot of these things on the job, and I just thought, well, I always like to study, I was like, yeah. you know, go back to school, I always thought about maybe going back to a PhD or master's or whatever it was, um, I was trying to figure that out, and I was like, well, I want to get some theoretical, you know, academic, rigorous academic backing to what I'm doing on the job, right? Um, so let me look into programs that are teaching. And then I found out that, you know, masters in data science were just starting to become a thing. Very few schools had it. NYU was like in one of the right. first year yeah. also of it. Um, and then Columbia was starting one. And right. it was actually funny because when we applied and we got our acceptance, it was like, you're accepted. And as long as we get the approval by the state yes. <laughs> before you know the school year starts, so it was still like it was a little bit of hesitation there yeah. whether it was going to happen, and it did thankfully. Um, but yeah, so I was happy to come on to one of the first master's programs in the country for data science. So that you know, the, so but to sort of answer your question, right? Like what motivated me to to go for the master's is wanting to get the more rigorous academic mathematical training behind. Stuff that I was learning on, you know, Stack Overflow and, and so on. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I think, yeah, like you mentioned, you uh, were at Howard and you were pursuing an applied math degree. So, how would you describe your uh, the, the transition to data science? Was it easy for you? Was, was it intuitive? Or uh, you mean from a like sort of academic perspective, yeah, like what I was learning back in applied math to how to apply to data science? Very relevant. Um, I think a lot of the you know, the logical thinking, the mathematical thinking, the stats, you know, like as part of my applied math program, I had to do some basic level of statistics and probability. Um, so that definitely helped when I came here for the master's. So I had, you know, a, some of it was review, some of it was building on the skill set that I already had. Um, having also done programming courses, uh, or a course, <laughs> um, I did for this one <laughs> in college, it was um, and, but having, you know, programmed in just 
same job that I've had to different levels of um, rigor, you know, doing the same thing, working in different languages, right? I had um, C back in, in college. I did um, ITB, which was a, a slang, if you will, like at, at Goldman when I did my internship there. Um, then, you know, I had learned some front end stuff on my own. Um, and then SQL, also for a job, and then starting to do Python like, by myself yeah. from the job. You know, all of, like that computer science skills were definitely very relevant when I came to, to the data science side, right? Because the data science is really a combination of computer science and math, yeah, right, at the exactly. end of the day. So having a little bit of background on, on both sides um, was definitely helpful. And, you know, the, the programmatic way of thinking almost, right? The way that you approach problem and you think of it, you think through it in terms of the math, but also the how do I implement this in computer code, <laughs> right? Like that programming mindset um, is definitely very helpful. I think being in this field, you've always got to be prepared to learn uh, new technologies as and when they come. So having that interest to actually go back to school and um, maybe get a more professional or academic it's backing to what you're going to do in your professional world is very important. Um, yeah, and, and to the yeah. point a little bit, right, because you get a lot of people that, oh, I did data science, so I've developed some machine learning algorithm. Yeah. Like, I don't really need to go to school for it. I just, like, look it up online and someone has done it, and then I just sort of copy and code, copy and paste that code yeah. and, like, run it for, like, a real application. That's... I get a bit exasperated with that <laughs> uh, because there's like yes, a stack overflow is great. Learning, you know, seeing people's code online and adapting it to your own, you know, use case is super helpful, of course. Um, but I think there's a lot of times that people think that it's just a matter of like copy pasting and like switching yeah. parameters it, without really understanding yeah. what the the code is implementing. Like right. what is the actual algorithm underneath it, right? What is the actual math that supports the algorithm and what yeah. does that mean for you know the use case that you're applying it to the data set that you're training it on right like these are things that you really need to understand the underlying um concepts right um and i you know the whole i just get some machine learning code off of the internet and copy paste and then say like i developed the machine learning solution or ai solution to my you know real life problem can be very dangerous. So that was also what I wanted to make sure that I really knew what I was doing, that I wasn't just sort of, you know, you know, pacing, monkey replicating <laughs> <Yeah>. something. So <laughs> I think that, that was the same with us. And we thought we knew machine learning and when we began our first course here, we realized this you know, the whole Yeah, but I'm glad we actually took that step because when we, we came here to actually get yeah, exactly, the more yeah. serious academic part of the what we yeah. Um, so, you mentioned about uh, political campaigning that you did in Brazil. Yeah. Um, so, what piqued your interest to apply data science in a political setting? I had never thought of working in politics. And yeah. actually, there was you know, a few fields that I knew I was not going to get into. Yeah. One was medicine because I cannot stand <laughs> needles and blood. Yeah. And I was like, nope, medical school, not for me, for sure. Um, and then politics never really appealed to me. I was like, no, I don't, I don't see myself working in it. And then the invitation came up to to you know go work in the elections, and I was like, that doesn't make sense. Now that has nothing to do with me. But then it was like, okay, well, I'm actually doing this data work for it. So then it made sense, yeah. right? It's like from a data perspective, it was really interesting, you know, having a database of you know different people that we had all sorts of information about them, and we had like calculated a propensity score of how likely they were each candidate, uh, each person was to vote for each of the candidates based on their personal characteristics and so on, you know, mathematically based, I was like, oh, this is interesting, right? And then how do we use that to leverage campaign actions um, or you know, yeah. to guide campaign actions? So am I, the message that I'm going to um, draft, if you will, for the people who are less than 40% likelihood of voting for my candidate, one, do I even want to talk to them? Is it even worth my time, yeah. right? That's what, the, Limited resources that we have, and that extends to anything in life, right? Not just politics. Um, or it's and you know, people who, who have like forty percent chance of voting, who care, or from this particular part of town, and has this like sort of profile, right? Is going to be different than the message they're going to craft to the person who is like a fifty percent, who is on this other side of town, cares about other issues, right? Yeah. And as long as the message is consistent, <laughs> and you're not you know lying to anyone, yeah. And you're just sort of saying, well, you know. 
you care about education. This is the, you know, the educational points of this candidate's platform, right? And this other person cares about well, healthcare and safety. Okay, well, these are the, the plans that this candidate has for those areas. And, you know, so to guide that a little bit um, was, was really interesting. And it was, you know, at its own, like the whole infancy of micro targeting and, and all of that. So it was interesting. I was like the, the data girl. I, I can call it the data girl a lot of times. <laughs> um, by both campaigns. So I was working uh, in two mayoral campaigns. Um, uh, yeah, I think we all know that politics sometimes can be a very sensitive issue. So, what do data scientists do when uh, when they're working in uh, these fields to remain on remain ethical in a sense and how do you handle people's data? So, yeah, I think it's becoming more and more of an issue, uh, and also like a tougher line to draw in a lot of ways. So back then, the way we were using it, uh, this is like back in twenty twelve, so this is a long time ago. Um, it was basically like I, you know, like I was just describing. Talk to people about issues that they care about based yeah. on the likelihood that they are to vote, and having the backing of the political uh, candidates' platform, right, and plans and all, all of that. So I'm okay with that. I don't see like major ethical yeah. issues there. As long as sure. you know, you're telling the truth, you're just saying, well, you care more about this, so I'm going to talk to you more about this important yeah. aspect of, of their plan rather than you know another one. Um, or I'm, you're already uh, basically the decided voter, either for our candidate or for another one. It's not worth talking, you know, spending my money to talk to you because you're not going to change your mind. You're very, less, very uh, less little likelihood that you will change your mind, right? right. Um, so, um, in the same way, like if you're already or very unlikely to vote for a candidate because of other things that we know, again, we're not going to talk to you. That that's okay. Uh, I think where we're seeing a lot of issues um, in the last few election cycles, right, <laughs> um, with Cambridge Analytica and all of that is, um, and not just them, but, you know, in general, um, is using information about people and sort of, like, what are their um, vulnerabilities and, right. yeah. and exploiting that, yeah. right? So if I know that you, like, some sort of psychographic thing about you, right, if I know that you are someone who's gone through a tough time and or you are vulnerable for whatever reason and exploiting that to my advantage. But I would say that that's the case, that's true, independent of the political um, you know, sort of use case. That would be true for the commercial use case as well when they're trying to sell you something. Um, here's what you're selling is a candidate, if you will, uh, or an ideology, right? Um, so another aspect of it is well, I am going to write more and more um, polarizing, right? Um, copy, if you will, right? I'm going to um, really exploit people's vulnerabilities and try to create a polarized society where it's us against them and, you know, on issues yeah. that really matter for everyone, right? This, so it's not about trying to um, advance or, or campaign for your own politician, for your own candidate anymore. It's more about like a strategy of let's divide and conquer, right? Let's separate and let's polarize people. And then we'll, we'll like have people who are more susceptible to being convinced of one ideology or another, right? Um, so I think that that's the part that really Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Where the ethical issues really come in. So I think you, as a data scientist, you have to stop and think, okay, what data am I using? Would I like someone to be doing this to me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, what am I doing with this? Am I just highlighting someone's toes, pros and like the things that they have that match that person's you know, views in, in a positive way? Or am I trying to use a divide and conquer strategy where let's polarize everyone, let's radicalize people as much as possible, let's, you know, spread hate. Um, and you know, advance that agenda forward to then come in and you know suggest sort of like the savior um, candidate who's going right. to make it all go away when you know that's not true, yeah. right? Or or blatantly lying too, right? Like saying that a candidate is going to do A when they have you know intention of doing A, right? That's not in their uh, platform or it's not feasible or doesn't make any sense or it goes against the interests, 
the best interests of the people that you're at, you know, advertising to, right. uh, or trying to convince to look for your candidate. Right. Um, but I would say that's true. I, I would say that's definitely the case in politics. Um, and but I would also extend that to other use cases, right? Like there's potentially commercial harm that you can do with that as well, right? Um, I was talking to someone the other day about um, gambling, like apps online. So, you know, if you have a gambling app, like what are, what data are they using to, and how are they doing the advertising to get people to get on their platform and online gamble? Are they exploiting people who have, you know, a tendency to become addicted to this? Yeah. Because like, right, that becomes a mental health issue, right, or a public health issue. Um, so, and that's not necessarily politics, yeah, um, but true. it could have very serious negative impacts as well. So. Yeah. Uh, how do you see this being resolved in the future? Should uh, is data literacy, uh, is the promotion of data literacy that solution, or should the government get involved? How would you see the situation being rectified in the future? I don't think it's an easy one um, to tackle, and part of the reason why I started my project um, online. So I have a YouTube channel, um, and I upload to you know social media, Instagram, and I get people to watch and watch that out. <laughs> watch out for that. Um, is I think there is like government has a role in it, but I also think that we as data scientists have a role in it, right? So. Part of the, the goal of my project is to share information um, and share knowledge uh, and sort of bring a lot of concepts in and like explain to people how data is being used, how their data is being used, why that matters, like what is an algorithm, right? Like how, what is AI, what does that really mean? Because a lot of people associate AI with like, you know, super science fiction and robots yeah. coming yeah. and like, ruling the earth and they're like, oh, we're so far from that, like that's never gonna happen. Um, or, there's also people who are like, oh, this is scary. Like, I, I don't want to get into it because yeah. I'm going to be creeped out and I'm not going to want to do anything in my life anymore and, you know, sort of just block it that way. Yeah. Um, and there's people who, like, just have no clue that, like, all of this is going on or, like, they sort of do, but, like, they don't understand the extent of it. And that's not, you know, all of their own or anything like that. It's just not something that they're exposed to. That's not their field of interest. Um, and all of these technologies, like we alluded to earlier, they are changing so quickly. Right, like we're developing new algorithms, new ways of like manipulating data, like the you know processors that we need to run more and more data are getting more powerful by the day. Right, like it's hard for us to keep up with it, much less yeah. people are outside of the field. Um, so I think it's we need to have a society that is more aware of all of these things, right? So that we can, as a society, have a conversation and decide how do we want to manage this, right? So I think, um, you know, government has a role in uh, writing legislation that protects people, um, right. but a lot of times the legislators themselves don't really understand how these things work, Yeah. right? Um, and then society also has a, a role in becoming more informed about these things um, and demanding protection of their rights, um, you know, or how are we going to manage those? Are people going to make money off of the data, their data that yeah. companies are collecting and using to make money? Um, or are we just going to have more avenues to like block the usage of our data? Or you know, what happens there? Or are we going to just say, well, companies can do this, this, and this, but not this, this, and this? Um, and then we as data scientists, I think, also have a responsibility because at the end of the day, we're the ones developing these technologies, right? So if you go to the big tech and there's issues with all of them to some extent, right? Yeah. So you should say, okay, well, it's a business problem because they're interested in making money. That's absolutely true. Uh, are we going to see businesses scaling back on their use of technology just out of the goodness of their heart? And, or, you know, thinking through the ethical implications out of their own volition? Right. I'm not so optimistic about that. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. I, I, yeah. It seems a bit to me. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, if you're a doctor, you have the Socratic oath that you abide by, right? Like, you, will, you have ethical principles that you have to operate by when you're making your medical decisions, right? If you're a civil engineer, you have responsibility that if you make a building, you design a building that falls on someone's head, you're held accountable, yeah. right? We don't have anything like that for technology, right? 
data science engineering, as far as I know, like you know, computer <laughs> engineering. Um, should we have something like that? Maybe. Um, maybe we should start talking about it. I don't think something that's going to happen overnight, and it's it's also in some way much more complex, right? Because okay, a doctor if they make a decision and they kill someone, it's more easily um, how do you say uh, they have like, less with this. Right? Yeah, but like yeah. you can also like sort of pinpoint that like this decision led to this yeah. person dying, and it right. was done by this person, so this person is accountable for it. Um, whereas, and same thing with you know the the building example, like someone designed it, right. wasn't to standards, yeah. it fell and killed people. Like it's a more you know sort of straightforward um, accountability path. Yeah. Whereas with us, like okay, you develop a, a new algorithm, right? Like, yeah. Random forest models didn't exist before. Then you develop a random forest model. You know, the, the technology for, you know, the, the sort of the basic algorithm for random forest. Okay, great. And then someone went and applied it, you know, in a company like years down the road on, on something that then discriminated against people. Um, and maybe that made them either just, you know, discriminate against them or, and, and that made them like not be able to get a loan or something yeah. or, um, got profiled by you know some situation, or maybe he ended up then being like arrested um, unnecessarily, right? right? Like yeah. unfairly or without them having actually committed a crime. Is the person who developed the original random forest model responsible, or is the person who developed that version of the random forest model, you know, to be held accountable, or is it an issue that, for example, the police um, department that was using that just and, and the police officer that arrested that person, they don't really know how the random forest model works. That yeah. or I'm just you know using random forest here, right. like, yeah. like the, you know the algorithm that determines that that person was likely to have committed that crime, um, and they didn't understand what that really meant when the, the algorithm made that recommendation because they took it at face value because to them there's a machine that's telling them this person is it. They take it as face value, you know as absolute truth and then right. therefore it's that person there's no question about it right so i think we need to be thinking a lot yeah. about like all of these steps like how you know accountability for all those steps um and as a data science thinking okay well i'm going to develop this algorithm what are the societal impacts that this could potentially have am i using the right data set is my data set um representative of the people that it's going to be applied on right what is my data set my algorithm doing at the end of the day, like how do I present that recommendation, right? How do I um, sort of put in all the necessary disclaimers and caveats that make people think about, okay, well, this is like a 90% chance that it's correct. This is a 10% chance that yeah. it's not, right? And therefore, what do we need to make sure that once there is this, this recommendation made by the algorithm, that we are not, you know, doing right. something really bad <laughs> <laughs> in the end. So I think it's, a lot of us is gonna. A lot of it is gonna have to come from us thinking through it um, and having that sort of training, because like most people, when they're most data science, when they're developing algorithms, they're not thinking, oh, I want to be people and I want to yeah. hurt people. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're, they're yeah. just developing algorithms. Yeah. Sometimes they caught up, in, you know, in the excitement of the optimization and the math, because we're all nerds to some extent, and you know, we like to see our accuracy going up. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we don't think too much about. What do we do to get there? Yeah. Um, and sometimes you just don't have the foresight uh, into seeing down the road the implications that it could have, or you didn't even think that oh maybe someone like some police someone you know police department would take that at face value and like not even think twice about the results because for right. you it's so natural that it's ten percent error rate, yeah. right? Um, and there's false positives. Like, yeah. They don't understand what false positive is. You know, like how, how many really right? exactly? So. Yeah. It's like a communal effort, and then society is also, I think, has, you know, has the responsibility too. So you, you know, you got to learn a little bit about, like, you know, what's in your food, and you know, like, how, you know, you, you learn how to cross, you get a little both ways before you cross the street, right? Yeah. So maybe like let's get the basic knowledge so that we can all make smart decisions about the technology that we're using, that we can amend, um, you know, legislation and protection from our our governments and you know companies and. Data for yeah, I think making the average person aware about what's actually happening happening with their data is very important. And I 
I'm really glad you started your YouTube channel yeah, on that. You. <laughs> so that that's really interesting. Um, what do you say you do um, currently? Mm -hmm. um, consultant in mm -hmm. AI, data science, data analysis, technology as a whole. So throughout my career, I've done um, a number of things, <laughs> right? So I mentioned some of it already. Um, you know, when I was doing my master's, I was a mentor consultant um, working on in the within the company that I was working for. Um, I was in the team that was sort of like a startup within it and would focus on the more technical projects. Um, so the way to describe right. ourselves was we're consultants plus developers, right? So right. we were both doing the traditional management consulting work of sitting down with clients, understanding what their business problem is, how do we solve it, right? Uh, and then, you know, managing that with them and so on, like at all levels, including the two levels. Um, but then we're also developers from the standpoint that we would be doing things that go beyond Excel, right? So either because your data set's so big and that Excel can't handle it, um, and you need you know, sort of like proper databases, a database or whatever it may be the case, um, or because we needed to do some more you know, advanced uh, analysis, whether it got to the point of machine learning or not, um, with very you know, case-by-case basis, or because we needed to do sort of like a web application because at the end of the day, what they really needed was to be able to you know get the data in the proper database and get it visualized in some way to help them generate the super piece insights that they needed. Um, and sometimes we did sort of like right. all of the above, right? Like get your data on a computer database, run some machine learning on it, output the results onto like a web application. Um, and so at some point, I was living in London for half a year. Half of that time, I was working in the Netherlands and still doing my master's here. So oh it my was God. way too You're much. Really spread out. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, Monday through Thursday, I'll be in the Netherlands. Friday to Sunday, I'll be in London. And then, you know, doing remote classes uh, here at Columbia for the master's. And so at some point, I was like, this is something's got to go. <laughs> I'm not quitting my master's, so I quit my job. Uh, went full time for the, the one semester in 2018, graduated, and then I just started consulting independently. So doing a lot of that similar type of work, uh, but you know, independently for a much smaller tends to be a uh, company. We have projects at the World Bank now, um, and then it depends on the project needs um, and company needs really. So some companies I'm doing more of the analysis, some companies I'm doing helping them think through like, what products can be developed, who the data they have. More like a product management role, so you know, I also did that. Right. Um, so a little bit after like 2019, um, I also worked at another company um, where I was managing like a data science project um, from a product management perspective. So you know, kind of taking all of that those skill sets that I developed throughout the years and, and integrating that and adapting them to whatever business case my my client has. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So then, uh, what would you say was the the best part of being involved in the startup culture because as I understand there are a lot of students here uh, in the ESI who are thinking of getting into this so what, what would you say is the best part of it and what yeah you mean like independent consulting like myself yeah. or like if uh, going to some sort of quote unquote proper startup uh, uh, either one okay. okay um in the startup world I'll start there um things move really quickly which can be exciting but can also be dangerous again, depending on what it is that you're doing. So the whole move fast and break things, that's like a mantra for all a lot of startups. I sometimes think a little bit issue with that. There's moments where that's fine, and there's moments where that's not so okay to break things. <laughs> right? <laughs> when that has again like you know cyber impact and you know could potentially harm people. Um, but things move very quickly. Um, and there's a big learning curve there and you definitely Learn a lot of like how to manage the technologies, how to you know sort of be very very versatile and like a generalist in many ways, because um, oftentimes that's the case. Um, and you, you know, you develop new product. It's cool to see it come to fruition when it does. Um, and and yeah, but there's also issues with startup culture. It tends to be very burly, um, as a woman especially, you know, that can have these issues. Um, but also. That's true outside of startup world too. <laughs> so, um, you know. Um, but, but yeah, so it's often exciting work. Um, I think sometimes startups tend to be a little too idealistic in what they're trying to do, or, you know, every other startup that can disrupt uh, in 
wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Some will. <laughs> uh, a lot of them won't. So I think just not getting yourself like put it in the delay too much uh, and kind of keep a critical eye throughout the process is important. Um, and then in terms of kind of independently consulting, I think it's I think to do that it's helpful to have had some of those experiences before. So from startup right. side, maybe in a more corporate world, um, different types of experiences um, across industries, across roles, I think is important. Um, and you know, it can be challenging in some ways, right? Like you're operating by yourself a lot of the times. Um, and you have to do it all. <laughs> yeah. um, or, you know, there's no there's not a lot of stability a lot of times. Um, but you also get sometimes the big picture of more like what you work on, um, on who you work with and what types of projects that you do and the flexibility of your schedule and things like that. So those are cons of everything here. <laughs> So, um, you are, so your current uh, work is like your own independent consulting firm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been about a decade since you started it? I've done it on and off throughout my whole career, like back when I was in the World Bank, when I first graduated from college. Okay. Yeah. Years ago. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> back in 09, um, I started doing some projects on the side, and then when I was doing the election work, it's also kind of that set up um, and I've alternated with working full time places and then going back to consulting full time or sometimes part time and then yeah. school and then again consulting and then <laughs> another job, full time job and then a you know, more consulting. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, you have switched around a lot of industries. You've, yeah. you've worked in consulting, you've worked in finance, mm -hmm. um, you've worked in politics. Mm -hmm. Um, have you envisioned yourself to start or to get some experience in a new industry? Are you looking to explore something else or what have you decided for yourself in maybe the next five years or maybe the next ten years? Mm -hmm. um, is there something that you've thought of? Sure. So this project that I'm doing on the channel um, is something that I'm doing sort of on the side of my free time. Um, and you know, some hiatus is in between. <laughs> um, when I'm you know, creating content for it, and it's a lot of work, uh, but it, I, it's something that I found that I really enjoy doing. Right. Um, both from a having to think through the concepts and the issues that we're facing, and think through how do they, how do I explain that to someone who's not that mentally, right? Who, who doesn't necessarily have an automatic interest in that, right? Not right. coming, searching for, oh, I want to learn about what is AI, right? right? But or an algorithm, or I want to learn how my data is being used, but who I think should be aware of these concepts, right? I need to like just hook them in and say, okay, hook them in for sure. <laughs> but you know, like, here's why this is interesting and yeah. why you should hear about it, right? And why you should want to learn more. Um, so that has been an interesting challenge to think through those things and make contents that um, will appeal to that phase at the same time as being formative, right, and being rigorous and um, being conceptually accurate, <laughs> right, right? Uh, and highlighting the things that I think I, you know need to be highlighted. Um, so, and then you know, more and more, I've been thinking of all the ethical or more issues and how, like, what are some really all the conversations that we've been having, and how do I kind of get more of that message across, not just to just the general population, but also to like data scientists. And exactly. like how do we instill right. this, these um, concerns and this thinking, you know, like in our community? Yeah. Um, so I think I see myself like dedicating more and more of my time to that. Um, and what format necessarily is that going to take? Whether it's going to be like helping companies think through those issues and from a consulting perspective, or that's going to be, um, you know, dedicating also more time to channel and you know getting that message out and thinking through different platforms and different ways of communicating that and different styles and like what works best for like what particular subset of the audience um, or if it's going to be potentially likely a combination of, of those two like, ways of, of approaching a problem or potentially you know like I don't know maybe working with the government at some point to draft you know help legislate 
draft uh, the policy or think through even like so on the government side there's the aspect of drafting legislation yeah. that I think is really important uh, but there's also like even how does the government you know use data right or uh, what data do they have that they could be using yeah. um, to you know generate policy or programs and so on um, that would be helpful for the population uh, but also how does government um, like where is government sort of overreaching right like where maybe they're collecting data that they should be collecting or using data in ways that they shouldn't much like companies are doing so right, right? um and and kind of have bringing their awareness throughout different levels um of government so i i can see myself being more involved in those ways because i'm just going to keep on evolving so we'll see <laughs> yeah, I feel like are going to take a to this work they're going to be doing so yeah i mean not just the legislatures but even the youtube videos like you were saying um, just getting out there, reaching out to the public, um, technical diagnosis in those worlds, and making data scientists, or like you said, nerds like us, aware about um, what our projects actually lead to, maybe get them thinking about that. And yeah, joining joining the government, um, thinking about how to implement good policies that could actually work. Yeah, um, yeah when I say yeah. nerd, I mean, like, you know, most engineering like possible. I put yeah. myself one. <laughs> it's not like you know a bad thing in my in my mind. Um, but you know, just also from my perspective, like it's easy for us to get caught up in you know when we're doing our problem sets for for you know our our classes. Yeah. It's easy for us to get up caught up in the technical aspect of it, and you yeah. know, like for sure. math group, like yeah, I did this math group great. But what are the yeah. reasons of it, right? Like, or I designed this algorithm. It's really good. <laughs> I optimize the hell out of it. Right? <laughs> like my accuracy is super high. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Then now what? Right? Like yeah. there is value to doing it for its own sake and advancing like the technical uh, tools that we have. There's absolutely value in that. Um, but also, you know, how do I think about the other implications and the practical things that um, we're we're doing? Getting more and more excited about that and wanting to kind of play a role in that space. Yeah, I think that's going to be important for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, coming to Colombia, uh, what what would you say is, has been your favorite memory of uh, this place and the DSI? Cool. Um, so I think the structure of the program then, and you know, my personal situation at that time is different from what. Focus is now right, so I was doing it part time, so right. working a lot. I was yeah. work a lot, um, and I actually wasn't able to take advantage of a lot of things that I wanted to come taking advantage of because I was like, you know, half the time wasn't here. Um, and, you know, like I had like really night classes, Tuesday and Thursday night classes, and sometimes I could only come to Thursday night class because Tuesday I was traveling for work, right? Yeah. Um, but I did really enjoy when I was here full time, um, being able to take advantage of like the talks that you know they would have. Um, across different departments and taking classes across different departments. Um, I wish I had had more time to do that, to take more classes with at SIPA, take more classes within the uh, you know the engineering and computer science departments outside of the like core curriculum of data science, um, and just having access to you know everything an institution like Columbia offers is is amazing, right? Um, and getting to meet other people and work with professors and all of that. Uh, I think that was. I would like to do more of that when I have a chance to, um, because of the way that you know other things go around. Um, but when I was here and I had a chance to do that, like I audited a, a bit of a class in at SIPA, which was like about technology and policy. Um, I didn't get audit all of the whole semester because it had like capstone conflicted. Right. Um, I also audited a bit of a class on like UI and UX, um, so that was interesting too from you know my own. How I develop things that are visually appealing and being friendly to the, with the right. end user and so on. So the value, like my most sort of professional commercial value yeah. to, to that. But um, you know, that's a skill set that I developed over time too, and it's great to have a little bit more you know, training for it too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I'm a very curious person, and I have very diverse interests. So when I, I just look at the the course catalog. Yeah, I like half the class. 
you know, there's like classes in business school, there's about innovation, you know, yeah. business school too, and you know, explaining what other because as data scientists we can't potentially impact a lot of industries, right? Like data being used everywhere, exactly. right? From like health to education. Like I went I think I had taken a class in education, I had taken classes in education school. Um health education, you know, politics, like everything, right? Um having the chance to explore a little bit more those different areas, I think is something that everyone should be taking advantage of when they are in institution like this. Because that's when you have the time <laughs> to do it. That's true. Yeah, I think uh, all of us are going to look to identify areas where we can apply data science. And yeah, and I, I think like a few years probably after you graduate, I'm not, I'm not sure, but we started the data, data for Good program. So that's also benefiting a lot of students here. And maybe we're also starting to talk about how data is applied in the real world, starting to think about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. I didn't have that in my time. So <laughs> but I'm maybe really glad because it of you. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it started because of you. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, you were, you were in, you mentioned you were in London, you were working in the Netherlands, and you were also taking your classes here. Mm -hmm. Seems like you enjoy traveling. I do, a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, what, what was your best experience there? Like, was it, uh, was it working in different industries or what do you do when you travel? What do you look forward to? In general life or like in work context? Both, whichever you wish. Yes. Okay. Uh, so when I left the bank, the World Bank, and back in 2011, I did a round the world trip by myself for oh, three wow. months. Wow, okay. It's called like commercial backpacking. Yeah. And I did like Europe, the parts of Europe. I went to South Africa and then I went to Southeast Asia. So it was a great experience and you know, spent my life. Highly recommend people doing that. <laughs> uh, my parents still think I'm crazy for doing it. Okay. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I I'm from Brazil originally. So I, you know, I came here. I already have sort of like an international experience by just the nature of being an immigrant and everything. Um, but then I I love learning about know, different cultures and languages and so on. So I try to travel as much as I can. Um, in consulting, it sometimes it got a bit tiring because when you're working like when you're traveling Monday to Friday every single week, it's a different, sure. yeah, you know, for work, okay. yeah. yeah, and it's a different schedule, and it's, it's like you're not being able to enjoy it as much. So right. Right. But um, I always thought it was also interesting. Like I did a project in Colombia for a few weeks uh, before going to London, and then they're working for a bank. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as a management consultant, but my client was. Um, and then the Netherlands was also a bank, actually, we did a lot of bank projects, <laughs> finance projects. Um, but it was really interesting to see how other countries and societies operate, like what do they value, right? Um, how, and, and I think it, traveling helps you open up your mind to other things that you never thought could be interesting and cool, and you know, different ways of seeing life that you never thought of, uh, or that you maybe had some sort of prejudice or preconcept of what it was like and then you get there and you're like, well, I'm not quite like that and that's a lot more interesting than I thought or whatever. Um, but also I think it makes you value what you have at home a lot. Uh, makes you use the things that you that you have and makes you realize the privileges that you have in your home country. Um, makes you be able to sort of say, okay, well, there's this way of doing things that they do and whatever, wherever you are. There's this way of doing things and my hometown, like yeah. which one do I actually think is the best one, right. right? As opposed to, well, this is all I've known and I've never seen anything different, so that's how I think. Yeah, right. Sure. Um, and I think there's value in that, not just to your own personal life, but I think there's value in that in your professional career as well, right? When we're talking about like legislation for data science, right? Like, the, uh, Europe approaches in a very different way than the US does, right? Yeah, right. I think we can learn from that. Yeah. Um, are we going to move in the same way that they do, or should we move in the same way that they do? Maybe, maybe not. There's aspects of it that'll say probably. There's mm -hmm. way aspects of it that I may say, well, maybe that's not how we do things over here. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but having that exposure, um, I think it's it, it's really helpful, and you know, learn it helps you learn how to deal with differences. Yeah. Right. Um, and collaborate and sort of work on the synergies rather than focus on the like. The things that make you different and set you apart you're saying like well i have the skill set that person has the skill set or i have this way of seeing life that person has that way of seeing life where can we meet in the middle um right. and i think 
that's helpful for all aspects of life. So that's one of the things that we work on. I actually really like. Good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually really like the part about um, understanding the way that different countries are uh, apply their data science legislatures. So I think you would have gotten a lot to learn from that for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's really interesting. I think yeah. that's something I would look forward to. Well. And operate too, right? And like you know the concept of vacation uh, and time yeah. off and like work life balance and Europe, Europe cultures, also, yeah, and you know other yeah. places much of Europe talking because that's where I spent a lot of my time, yeah. but in other cultures versus what we had, which one is the best one, which one do we want to adapt, adapt to, yeah. or do we want to have for ourselves, right, so. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, do you have any places that uh, are on your must-visit list, like any countries that you need, that you want to go to, or something like that? If I was going to make a recommendation for someone, yeah. no, oh, no, if something you, you oh, want yeah. for my yeah. <laughs> COVID has kind of you know, yeah. sure. gotten in the way of yeah. the list, <laughs> the least. Um, but a place that I really want to go is like the Middle East. So like I really want to go to um, Petra, Georgia, um, or Jordan, um, and. Something totally different because yeah. I've done a lot of Europe and yeah. I love Europe and yeah, I always want to go back to yeah. Europe, right? And I still didn't live there for yeah. a while. Um, I also really want to do South America more. But I'm, even though I'm from there, I, I've i only been, I don't even count having been to Argentina because <laughs> I just like cross the border um, to see the Diego to Fall, right. you know, their side looking into the Brazilian side, um, and then like going out to dinner and like, party there when I eat, but I don't even count that. Um, and because I didn't really explore the country and the culture. And then having spent like three weeks in Colombia for a project, I took some time off in the weekends and you know, explored a little bit, but but not nearly enough. And like South American culture is like so rich mm -hmm. um, across the whole continent, right? South and Central. Also, um, well, I didn't say Mexico, but also like poor name there. So very, you yeah. know, little. Um, Machu Picchu is a place I would love to go. And then within Brazil, there's so many places like the Amazon and stuff. And now it's like in the center of the country. Um, that I so many places that I want to visit in such a diverse country. So yeah. if I had to recommend not that I'm biased or anything, I'll definitely say go to Brazil <laughs> at some point in your life. <laughs> um, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So like you know, part of me sometimes like I'll just take some time off and do you know South yeah. America like backpacking. And I'm not like, I'm not backpacking anymore. <laughs> but you know, just yeah, want to get back on the road. And explore more. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean. Thank you so much for the fun conversation. Um, would you mind taking part in like a rapid fire round where we ask a bunch of questions and you just say the first thing that comes to your mind? Sure. <laughs> All right. Sure. Let's vote. Okay. So, uh, which programming language do you prefer? Python, but it's my question. <laughs> Some people <laughs> prefer yeah, R. There are people who prefer R. I know, I know. No, I'm a Python <laughs> Okay. Um, what data science course did you find the hardest? The hardest? Not rapid fire right now. Um, <laughs> I think applied machine learning was quite challenging, um, but also very helpful and useful. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, your favorite hobby? Uh, what is a hobby? Hobby. <laughs> <laughs> also dancing. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, when do you like coding? Morning, evening, night? Never. <laughs> I, I do like coding. Yeah. Um, never not the, the answer. Okay. Um, if it depends a bit on when the inspiration flows. Tends to be more at night than I would like it to. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think student <laughs> life totally gets that. <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what is your pet peeve about data science that you would not like someone? Yeah. Um, <laughs> having to do data cleaning. <laughs> 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 Having you know a client go, this is what we need. 
you know, yeah. no, thank you. <laughs> now, you know, I can do my job better or this insight, right. tech insight that I wanted to, you know, gather from the data or the decision making that I need to use more. So. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Validating, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Me, Ashley, Lawrence, and I. And we have one more friend. Oh, yes. yes. They're coming. They're yes. coming. <laughs> if you guys have any suggestions on topics or requests, also send them my way whenever you feel like it. We would most like to see. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Good, Good luck to your investors here, too. Both Thank academically you. and you know, internships and job searches and all of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, if anyone wants to get in touch at any point or have any questions that I can help you out in any way, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Yeah, that sounds good. Bye.